Subhanallah. Do you see the uh, the five? Do you mean on the screen or in the folder? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So, so now, inshallah. Inshallah. All the praise and all the glories due to Allah, and I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad. This is last prophet and messenger. May the blessings and peace of Allah be upon our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his kids, and those who followed his path up to the day of judgment. My dear respected brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Back to a new session, uh, comment, commenting on that al ahkam Uh, I mentioned before that Umdat al Ahkam is a compilation of the most authentic ahadith on the legal rulings, uh, uh, which was basically compiled by uh, Abdul Ghani al Maqdisi, and it was commented by many scholars in Arabic. Our goal is to emphasize the methodology of the scholars in deriving legal rulings from their respective sources. In today's session, uh, my brothers and sisters, we are resuming uh, our uh, explanation of the hadith, and we stopped last time on hadith number 11. What did the Prophet وسلم, used to say Upon entering the Tawlet. And Anas ibn Malik, and the Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Kana ida dakhal al khala'a, Kaal Allahum inni a'udhu bika min al khubthi wal khaba'ith. On the authority of Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, who said, Upon entering the Tawlet, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubthi wal khaba'ith. O oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from the male and female harmful devils. This hadith of the Prophet, first of all, uh, it included two terms that need actually explanation. The first is the word al khala. And the second is Al-Khubth uh, Wal-Khabaith. Al-Khala uh, Khala is a verb and Khala is an empty or vacant place. But al has been used to refer in Arabic language to the place where the people used to go alone to answer the call of nature. This is a type of euphemistic expression. Euphemism is to use sometimes a decent term or a decent wor word to express something that is not proper or even appropriate to speak about it explicitly. So al-khala was originally used to mean a vacant place but later, and this place was always visited by people to answer the call of nature. And afterwards, it has been used to refer to the uh, 
to the to this type of place. And so the same meaning is expressed in Arabic language by the word al ghait Al ghait refers also to a low place where people go and visit to answer the call of nature. It's so al khala and al ghait are synonyms. But the word al ghait has been used in its euphemistic expression to refer to urine and stool. So it refers to whatever is extra exits of uh, a person's private parts called al ghait And this is a method of Arabic language to, to be more decent. And it has been used in many uh, occasions. So they use sometimes the place to refer to something which happens in this place. So they use the word al ghait but here in this hadith, as you see, it uses actually the word al khala Anyhow, also this hadith included two words which need expl explanation. The al khabaith al khubth It is read as al khubth and al khubuth al khubth and al khubuth al khubuth It is a plural of the word khabith and it is pronounced Hoops. It refers to the noxious devils, and also interpreted as evil in general. So when a person enters into the bathroom, he asks, seeks Allah's help from or against the devils or any harm that may be inflicted on him. Al-Khaba'ith Al -khaba'ith is the plural of the word Khabitha. And Khabitha, it refers to the female noxious devils. So when a person enters, he actually refers to both from, seeks Allah's refuge from the female and the male, the male and the female devils. Because those places are usually inhabited by the devils according to the authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that we will explain uh, now, inshallah. The first sentence in this hadith is the Prophet وسلم, used to say. It indicates that the Prophet وسلم, used to make this supplication frequently and regularly when he enters into the tawalit. When the Prophet ﷺ also wanted to answer the call of Nietzsche, he used to say this dua. So the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ noticed that the Prophet ﷺ frequently pronounced it when he enters, when he likes to answer the call of Nietzsche. And when th there is a rule in Islamic jurisprudence or in Islamic uh, usul al-fiqh, that when something is frequently and regularly repeated by the Prophet ﷺ, and such a thing is not obligatory, the frequent and regular practicing of an action by the Prophet ﷺ refers to the fact that it is emphatically recommended. It is emphatically recommended. So it is recommended to say this dua when a person enter, enters the bathroom. Uh, but there is, a, there is a point here, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, and this is actually confirmed through many other hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ, that he used to say this, and when he, the Prophet ﷺ, wants to leave he also used to say alhamdulillah alladhi adhaba anni al-adha wa'afani praise be to allah who made me enjoy enjoy it uh, retained what is beneficial and relieved me of its impurity so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to Praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all occasions and he used to make zikr in all occasions. 
So it is highly recommended to say this dua when a person enters into the bathroom. When he leaves the bathroom, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha instructed us how the Prophet sallallahu leaves his toilet. How the Prophet sallallahu would say, I see, he say, used to say, I seek your forgiveness, O oh my Lord. I seek your forgiveness, O oh my Lord. And we will explain why the Prophet وسلم, said, I seek refuge or I seek your forgiveness. The Prophet وسلم, did not make a sin. Why does the Prophet وسلم, say غفرانك, when he leaves the bathroom? Does anybody know? Why the Prophet ﷺ used to say Ghufranak? To increase his He hasanat. seeks Allah's forgiveness. What do you say? To increase his hasanat rank. Uh, yeah, and because also, you know, the Prophet ﷺ did not mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during his stay in the bathroom. Because it's not... Yes, we don't do this type of, of ibadah in the toilets. But the Prophet وسلم, is still having a feeling of a shortcoming. So he seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in this occasion. Or the Prophet وسلم, seeks Allah's forgiveness because of feeling about the great bounties that Allah has showered upon him. The great bounty of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitated for the son of Adam all those bounties which are showered on him by day and night. Food and drink everywhere, every time. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also enabled him of exiting this water. Allah subhanahu mentioned that as a bounty in the Quran in Surah Al-Hijr. He says, وَمَا أَنْتُمْ لَهُ بِخَازِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent water for you from the heavens. وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا عِنْدَنَا خَزَائِنُ وَمَنْ نُنَزِّلُهُ إِلَّا بِقَدَرٍ مَعْلُومٍ وَأَرْسَلْنَا الْرِيَاحَ لَوَاقِحَ فَأَنْزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَأَسْقَيْنَاكُمُ وَمَا أَنْتُمْ لَهُ بِخَازِنِينَ We have sent down rain from the sky or we have sent down rain for you so that you can easily drink it. وَمَا أَنْتُمْ لَهُ بِخَازِنِينَ And you cannot store it in your bodies. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also facilitated the son of Adam of the ability to exit all of the dirt and the filth included in his body. So this is another reason of seeking Allah's forgiveness. Look how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hemmed the praise of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in every single occasion. He was the best of a zakirin. So we, need, we, we would like a, a very important point of dhikr. My brothers and sisters, the dhikr of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the highest and the greatest act a person is rewarded for. And it's the easiest act according to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi explained in other hadiths. So the Prophet وسلم, did not leave any opportunity without making dhikr for Allah. Also, according to this hadith, it says on entering the tawlet. What does this sentence mean? Does it mean that when the Prophet وسلم, enters the tawlet, he says, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khub wal khaba'ith. Because the word when, iza, it indicates that when a person enters, so when he engages in the work. The scholars explained that there must be, there must be an ellipsis. There is a word which is conceived from the text under discussion. And this word is on when entering or when he wants to enter the toilet. Why? 
because the Prophet وسلم, cannot mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside those um, uh, towelets because it is prohibited. It is prohibited to mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those towelets. There are many hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that the Messenger وسلم, used to mention the name of Allah or he used to make dhikr all the time frequently except when he was in the bathroom. And also it was reported that the Messenger وسلم, used to take off the ring before entering the bathroom because the ring of the Prophet وسلم, included the name of Allah on it, which is engraved on it. So he cannot actually mention the name of Allah. So it is better to say that there is an ellipsis in this text, which means that the Prophet وسلم, before actually engaging in, into entering the bathroom, he, would, he used to say, Bismillahi, according to the other version, Bismillahi, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al wal khabais. And this is also, uh, this is exactly, it's like the idha, which was used in, uh, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu idha qumtum ila salah, which means when you want to, Stand up for prayer because a person does not make wudu exactly when he goes to prayer. Because when he is in prayer, he is engaged already in an action. It's not possible for him to make wudu and prayer at the same time. So it is better to say that when you want to start making prayer, when you stand up for making, when you want to stand up to make prayer. Such is the case in Allah saying, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ So when you want or when you intend to recite the Qur'an, first seek refuge in Allah from the Satan, the expelled from his mercy. So it is better in this case to consider this ellipsis in the text. But if you don't, if you don't consider this ellipsis in the text, we have to admit that it is permissible to mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in the towelets. But the best way is to conceive that there is an ellipsis, especially there is another report, the hadith of Sa'id ibn Zayd and Abdul Aziz, in which the Prophet وسلم, it is the same hadith of Anas, but it was reported from another uh, tabi'i. In which he says, إِذَا أَرَادَ أَنْ يَدْخُلَ إِذَا أَرَادَ أَنْ يَدْخُلَ The Prophet وسلم, when the Prophet wanted to enter the tawalit, he would say this. Especially, my brothers and sisters, it is confirmed as I mentioned to you, that the Prophet وسلم, didn't have the practice of mentioning the name of Allah in tawalits or in dirty places or in filthy places. There is a hadith of Abu Juhaym al Ansari. When the Prophet وسلم, was met from, by a man coming from Bi'ru Jamal, the man met with the Prophet وسلم, and said, Assalamu alaykum. He greeted the Messenger. وسلم, but the Prophet did not answer his salam. Do you know that delivering salam, the delivery of salam is recommended. But responding to this salam is, is what? It is obligatory. As you know, it's obligatory. So the Prophet وسلم, did not answer his salam until he turned to the wall and he started wiping, striking the wall and wiping his face and hands. And then the Prophet وسلم, afterwards returned his greeting. Why the Prophet وسلم, wiped uh, or strike the over the, the, the wall? Can anybody answer? The Prophet وسلم, he wanted to do he wanted to do tayammum. Exactly. So the Prophet وسلم, wanted to make tayammum so that he does not mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except in a state of full ritual purity. 
state and found ritual purity. But this will bring us to another question that most of you may actually raise right now. Is it permissible to mention the name of Allah when a person, or is it necessary for a person to have a state of full ritual purity when he would mention the name of Allah even by just saluting somebody or greeting somebody? No, it is not it is not actually obligatory it's only recommended it's only recommended and this is taken from the hadith of the prophet so in conclusion we can say that the prophet did not mention the name of allah inside those towelets and what he did is before entering into the towelet the messenger would only say this dua or when he was in the desert why he was in the desert the prophet وسلم, used to say that before starting or being engaged in answering the call of teacher the messenger وسلم, explained for us the reason why should we say this dua he said in so these toilets are frequented by the jinn and devils. So when anyone amongst you goes there, he should say, I seek refuge in Allah from male and female devils. Is a, this is a proof that this dua was mentioned by, was done, was done actually by the Prophet Wasallam because he mentioned the, the illa, the rational. He, he mentioned the effective cause or the reason behind uh, doing this dua that these places are inhibited frequently inhibited by those uh, devils uh, noxious devils male and female so we seek Allah's refuge from them uh, moving to the other sentence Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al wal khaba'is this is the exact dua or invocation that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say upon entering the towers. But there is another hadith which was reported by Abdul Aziz ibn al-Mukhtar in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you like to enter the towers, you should say in the name of Allah, I seek refuge in Allah from male and female noxious devils. And Ibn Hajar graded this as authentic, meeting the conditions of Imam Muslims in his Sahih, Muslim in his Sahih. So the scholars concluded that it is also preferable to say Bismillah when you enter into the bathroom, because it has been quoted from the Prophet ﷺ. The Messenger ﷺ used to say it. And we have a rule, my brothers and sisters, in Usul al Fiqh, which is. When we have a version of the hadith which provides an addition, we must accept this addition as long as it does not conflict with the standard hadith which was reported by the majority of the other colleagues of that narrator. This is, it has a term. Can anybody uh, remind me of this term? We explained it before. We have a term for this. It is Ziyada to Thiqa, mashallah, Brother Salman. So it is ziyadat al thiqa So we act upon ziyadat al thiqa as long as it is proved through an authentic reporter. And number two, it does not go in apparent conflict with the hadith of the, uh, or the other versions reported by the colleagues of that narrator. So it is preferable to say, Bismillahi, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika, this is briefly some of the points that I wanted to share with you regarding this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Please, if you have any questions or any inquiries, you can share with us, inshallah. I had a question. So, um, with um, Al Khala, um, in modern terms, is it the entire bathroom or is it just where the toilet seat is? So if it's a large bathroom or if there's a facility that has a wudu section separate to the bathrooms, 
Um, what's the head or boundaries of the khala? <clears throat> Uh, Al Khala in this case, Jazakumullah for answering this question because based on that, is it permissible for a person to say Bismillah, for example, when he enter when he starts making wudu, for example? Uh, no, the Khala is actually restricted to the place where a person answered the call of nature. Uh, now we have our bathrooms uh, clean. And most of our bathrooms, they are big enough to uh, accommodate uh, uh, sometimes a fusint and a place to make wudu in. So in this case, there is no problem of saying Bismillah uh, even when you are uh, making your wudu inside those places. There is no problem at all. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Uh, the other hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the hadith of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu ta'ala anhu an Abi Ayyub an Abi Ayyub al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu qal قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أتيتم الغائط فلا تستقبلوا القبلة بغائط ولا بول لا تستدبروها ولكن شرقوا أو غربوا And found towels erected facing the Kaaba. So when we answer the call of nature, we used to turn away from it and seek the forgiveness of Allah, the Almighty, the glories. I'm sorry for this interruption. Maybe I, I click the microphone in a wrong way. So this hadith of Abu Ayyub in Al-Ansari shows the propition, the Prophet Sallallahu propition to face Qibla or the direction of prayer, the Kaaba, whether a person in a desert or whether he is in a toilet or in a place or indoor, either it is indoor or outdoor. And the Prophet ﷺ instead informed them to turn their faces either to left or to right, which means that to east or west, because the Qibla for the people in Medina, the people of Medina, the Qibla is in the south direction. It's in south. Mecca is located south to Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ said to them, turn east or west, which means that it's, you do not actually turn your faces right or left, but turn your faces east or west. Uh, everybody can hear me, my voice clearly, brothers and sisters? No, I'm sure. Okay, so. I'm receiving a call on WhatsApp. I thought that somebody is calling from your group. Alhamdulillah. So the Prophet ﷺ instructed them to turn their faces east or west. So the first 
phrase of this hadith reads as follows. When you go to the toilet to relieve yourselves from feces or urine, so the Prophet ﷺ here used the word ghaid, as I mentioned to you before, which literally used to mean a low place or a low ground where the people used to go in order to answer the call of Nietzsche. The word has been used later uh, in a form of euphemism for defecation. So this is a beautiful way of how the Arabic language use this euphemism. This euphemism is used many, uh, in many uh, statements or in, in many words of the Quran. Uh, like for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about Isa alayhi salam, Jesus and his, his mother, he says, Kana ya'kulani ta'am. He used to eat food. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't literally mean that they used to eat food. But it means that the Prophet ﷺ used, the, he refers to them that they used to go to the bathroom. So, but he used the euphemistic expression. Because when a person eats and drinks, naturally he goes to the bathroom. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to them, how do you dare to worship a person and his mother and both of them be answer the call of Nietzsche, which is, you know, it is a sign of deficiency. So here it, it refers to how a Muslim is supposed to use euphemism or to use decent and nice talks when he speaks to others. This is a feature of the Arabic language and it is a feature of the discourse of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A Muslim should not speak about, you know, some of our brothers and sisters, they take some of what you can call indecent words and they repeat them. And sometimes they use them, the slang. This is not appropriate in Islamic uh, mannerism. It is according to Islamic behavior, a Muslim should not uh, speak in that way. He should not face the Qibla nor turn his back on it. Look at this prohibition of the Prophet Fala. So the Prophet prohibited completely to turn one's face to Qibla or back to the Qibla. So the scholars differed with regard to facing or backing the Qibla while answering the call of nature. And there are eight views concerning this propition. These eight views are as follows. I need you to concentrate on them. Why? Because we train ourselves on how the scholars dealt with apparently conflicting a hadith of the Prophet. ﷺ. The first view says that it is prohibited to face the qibla while relieving oneself whether a person is in a toilet indoor or in any other location. And this is the view of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. How? Because Abu Ayyub al-Ansari even, you can ask me a question, but Abu Ayyub al-Ansari is talking generally here. Can we deduce from his statement that it also includes the uh, indoor toilets? Yes, it includes the indoor toilets because when he visited the Sham or Syria, uh, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari used to enter those toilets and afterwards he seeks Allah's forgiveness for that, which means that these people were making a mistake and he could not actually demolish those toilets, but he used to enter them, you know. So this is a reason that Abu Ayyub al-Ansari even believed that it is, it is related to both indoor and outdoor. Number two, it is absolutely permitted in all places. And this is the view of Urwat ibn Zubayr and Rabi'at al Ra'i, and he is a teacher of Imam Malik and Dawood al Zahir. We are going to say why they refer to this, but I need from you just to concentrate on those opinions. So the first opinion is complete propition, the second opinion is complete permission, and both outdoor or uh, indoor or outdoor. Okay. 
What about the third view? The third view is a majority of scholars, including Malik Shafi Ahmed and Ishaq. They said that it is permissible with settlements and townships, but not in desert or open places. So the second, the third view went to into a moderate path by saying that it is not permissible in the deserts, uh, but it is it is actually permissible indoor if a person has a toilet in the masjid or at his home and accidentally it goes in front of the or facing the qibla so it is permissible actually there is no problem about it abu hanifa is of the opinion that it's not permissible to face the qibla anywhere however backing the qibla to relieve oneself is permissible but he says that backing the qibla is permissible and we are going to see how why Imam Abu Hanifa referred to a certain hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, but he neglected the rest of the other hadith. Number five, it is undesirable makruh to turn one's face or back towards the qibla, whether outdoors or indoors. So it is only makruh, and this is the opinion of Al Qasim ibn Ibrahim, one of the two variants of uh, of the opinions of Imam Abu Hanifa, Ahmad and. Abu the sixth view is Abu Uwana uh, maintained that this prohibition is only restricted to the people of Medina and their faces or backs to the Qibla while answering the call of Nietzsche. And the seventh view is Abu Yusuf maintained that it's only permissible to back the Qibla while relieving one. So it is only permissible to back the Qibla while relieving oneself on the door. Otherwise, um, it is not permissible. Ibn Sirin holds that it's prohibited to face or back Mecca or Jerusalem while relieving oneself. And he actually extended this ruling based on analogy and saying that even the other places also honored, so we have actually to honor them. Basically, why do scholars have differed in that clear contradiction? This is basically the reason of the agreement, my brothers and sisters, is that we should admit that we have three basic ahadiths of the Prophet ﷺ, and each one of those ahadiths goes in a different direction. The first hadith is a hadith of whom? The first hadith is a hadith of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, right? What does the hadith of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari say? It supports the first view. The first view says that it is it's not it is prohibited to turn one's face or to turn one's back to the qibla to the kaaba while answering the call of nietzsche either it is in door or outdoor you got it this is the first opinion so the first opinion took the hadith let me first say to you three hadiths the first hadith is the hadith of abu ayyub and i'm sorry that we have just called the second hadith is the hadith Sorry for this interruption. So the second hadith of the Prophet وسلم, is the hadith of Ibn Umar. Ibn Umar ascended the roof of the Prophet وسلم, and uh, uh, he saw the Messenger وسلم, answering the call of Nietzsche and the Prophet وسلم, was turning his face towards the Qibla. Uh, the third hadith is the hadith of Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this is the hadith of Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu that one year before the Prophet's death sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he noticed that he found the messenger answering the call of Nietzsche answering his call of Nietzsche and he was turning 
his face to the Qibla. The Prophet ﷺ was turning his face to the Qibla or turning even his back to the Qibla. So we have three conflicting hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The first the group of scholars who stated that it is prohibited it is prohibited to answer the call of nature facing or turning one's back or face to the Qibla, they refer to which hadith I'm answering. Please, you, you can interact with me. So those, the first opinion, the, the, the people who refer to the Abu Ayyub, exactly. This is the first hadith that we have right now. The second group, the people who said that it is, pro, it is permissible absolutely to turn your face and your, and your back to the Qibla, what did they do? They refer to the third hadith. And how did they explain? They said that the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah, look, Jabir mentioned that he saw the Prophet sallallahu seeing the uh, turning his face okay, one year before his death. So he concluded what? Once he, he, he gave the chronology of the hadith, it means that the hadith of Jabir is abrogating the other hadith of the Prophet sallallahu That's why the hadith of Jabir has actually generally treated the whole issue. He said that it is, it is permissible in all ways, either to turn your face or your back, either in our door or indoor. The third of you, this is the majority of the scholars who said that the Prophet said that it is permissible to turn your face and back to the Qibla if you are indoor, but it is not permissible if you are outdoor. How did they deal with those hadiths? Can anybody answer this question? How did the, those scholars, the majority including Shafi'iyah, how did they deal with those hadiths? They dealt with these hadiths in, in a very important manner. My brothers and sisters, the rule that we have here is, it is better to act upon all hadiths if there is a room to reconcile among them, to reconcile all those hadiths. So, I'malu al-hadithi awla min ihmalihi. The rule says, acting upon all hadiths is better than neglecting one of them. You understand what I'm saying? This is the reason that al shafiiyah they said that an al-Malikiyya, an Imam Ahmad, and Ishaq, and this is the majority view. They said that the hadith of Abu Ayyub al Ansari should be understood to mean that it refers, it refers to what? It refers to outdoor. But the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al Khattab and also the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah, it refers to what? To indoor. So the Prophet used to face, uh, the Prophet used to face the Qibla or even and turn his back to the Qibla whenever he is in the door. Why? Because they have a wall to keep them screened and there is a barrier between them and the Qibla. You understand what I'm saying? The, this is the third of you. So the third of you try to reconcile. According to Abu Hanifa, he says backing Qibla to relieve oneself is permissible. Why? Because he, he saw Jabir, he quoted the Hadith of Jabir that he, the Prophet, he saw the Prophet Sallam turning his back to the Qibla. So Abu, uh, Abu Hanifa, he accepted one hadith, but on the other side, he did not act upon the other hadith, as you know. Number five, it is undesirable to turn one's face or back towards the Qibla, whether or door in door. And this is the opinion of Al-Qasim, as you see, that Abu Al-Qasim noticed that there is a discrepancy between why can anybody answer me and answer this? Why Abu Qasim, why Al Qasim ibn Ibrahim, referred to this opinion? Why he said that it is desirable? Can anybody inform me? We we already we already studied this point. Can anybody answer this? Because uh, there's there's another narration of the Prophet ﷺ facing the Qibla. I mean, turning its back towards the Qibla. Yeah, we have a contradiction between, exactly, there is, a, there is a difference between, there is a contradiction between the statement of the Prophet ﷺ and his action. You see what I'm saying? 
So they said that the action of the Prophet وسلم, said that or indicated that it's only for the sake of an instruction. So it is undesirable. It's only undesirable, but it's not haram. It's not prohibited. You see, as we give you some other examples before, when the Prophet وسلم, prohibited drinking while standing, but the Prophet وسلم, has been quoted as being seen drinking while standing. Or the Prophet ﷺ prohibited urinating while standing. But according to the hadith of Jabir, the Prophet ﷺ was urinating, urinating while standing. So in all of those occasions, we move to the, to the, what, to the lighter, to the hukm or ruling. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ's action on the opposite, or to the opposite, means that he does not mean total prohibition. The sixth view is Abu Awana, and he maintained that prohibition is only restricted to the people of Medina. This is too literal. Look how he rigidly, he, he stuck to the text in a rigid way, right? Because he considered that the people of Medina are here intended in the text. But the Prophet ﷺ just gave the, this as, as an example. You understand what I'm saying? And it has been actually uh, contradicted by Abu Ayyub when Abu Ayyub went to Asham. And Asham is in another direction, you see. So the Qibla, according to the people of Asham, is in a total direction, you say. But, but Abu Ayyub actually regarded that West and East is not literally interpreted to be East and West of the people of Medina. So Imam Shawkani called that it's, it's, it's too rigid and it's actually literal explanation of the hadith. So this is briefly, my brothers and sisters, how the, the, the scholars treated the, the Adilla. How the scholars treated the Adilla uh, in, this, uh, in this occasion. Uh, so there is another point which, uh, is, uh, which remains in this text, which is, is it prohibited to dislike? According to the majority of the scholars, they say that it is actually prohibited. Why? Because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, gives the, a verbal prohibition. This prohibition is not contradicted by any action. But you can say that the Prophet sallallahu has been reported as doing otherwise. But we could actually explain the action of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this case to mean that it is a specification of the general rule of the hadith of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. This is a specification. The Prophet ﷺ provided an exception. The hadith of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, this is literally uh, indicates that it is absolutely or generally prohibited in all cases, all occasions. But here the Prophet ﷺ provides us with a specification, taqsis. So this taqsis has been explained to mean that the Prophet ﷺ only did this in indoor. It's not outdoor. This is the reason that the contradiction between the Prophet's action and his statement is not a complete contradiction. The Prophet ﷺ did not contradict his statement by answering the call of nature, turning his face to the Qibla outdoor. But he did only indoor which means that it is taqsisul umum. It is a specification of the general terms of the hadith of Abu Ayyub. This is briefly the answer on this, uh, uh, on this uh, point. Um, the cause of propitiation, what is, what, what is the reason if there is a'illah here? Scholars differed concerning the cause of this propitiation uh, but the first and most obvious reason is that is to show honor and reverence for the Qibla. And this is based on the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, which was reported by Salman ibn Wahram from Tawus who reported the Messenger وسلم, saying, when one of you comes to relieve himself, he should honor the Qibla of Allah the Almighty, the sublime. So let him not face or back it. 
So the Prophet وسلم, explained in this hadith that the reason is to Allah. Ibn Daqiq al Eid also supported this by providing another reason also of this prohibition. Uh, Isa ibn Ishaq related that he said to a Shabi, I wondered about Abu Huraira saying when one relieves himself, he should not face Qibla or turn his face, his back uh, towards it. While Nafa' related from Ibn Umar that he saw the Messenger of Allah answering the call of Nietzsche while facing Qibla. He said, as for Abu Huraira saying, it relates to answering the call of Nietzsche in open areas where there are slaves of Allah who offer prayers there. So in such a case, do not face them. Or your back on them. As for you, do what has been uh, quoted by Adara Qutni, uh, is a weak narrator. So, from this hadith or from this statement, uh, this uh, report, uh, Ibn Daqiq al Is provided another reason, which is people are prohibited to face the Qibla in our door because, in most cases, people they may pray in that direction. So we don't actually show our private parts and answer the call of Nietzsche showing a, a disrespect for them. So this is, it was actually the reason, but anyhow, uh, these are just based on rational reasoning. The Prophet ﷺ said, وَلَكِنْ شَرِّكُوا أَوْ غَرِّبُوا Face the east or the west. So if one resides in Medina, he should either face east or west when answering the call of Nietzsche, but it means a person must divert to the east or the west since the Qibla is located north of Medina. Uh, I'm sorry, I think this is a mistake and this. Uh, the Qibla is located south of Medina. It is south of the Qibla lies in other directions, must turn away from the course of its direction according to Ibn Daqiq and other scholars. This is briefly, uh, so another point which was raised by uh, Abu Ayyub al Ansari, he says, We used to turn ourselves and then sought Allah's forgiveness. The reason is. Or the question is, uh, 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 is uh, the uh, built or erected their buildings facing the Qibla. So he used to enter uh, because, as you see, Abu Ayyub al Ansari was of the opinion that. It is prohibited either outdoor or indoor, right? So the statement of Abu Ayyub, why does he seek Allah's forgiveness for them? Uh, some of the scholars said that uh, he, he was seeking forgiveness for those who erected those towelets. This is not possible because, because the towelets were constructed by but 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 there is a, a, a contention here because you can say that these these toilets have been first built by or constructed by the non-Muslims. It can also mean that he may have turned his face at the outset in the direction of the Qibla, and when he remembered the prohibition, he promptly changed his direction. And however, in that case, there was no reason for him to seek Allah's forgiveness since such an act was unintentional. But the scholars say that for those pious and righteous slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially you know the Sahaba of the Prophet, وسلم, they used to seek Allah's forgiveness even if they have an excuse of doing something haram in their perspective or in, in their own self. Even if he is make, but he has the valid excuse, legal valid excuse, because he cannot, you have to answer the call of Nietzsche, he cannot actually go anywhere else. But in that case, he seeks Allah's forgiveness. 
out of fear that he might have done something which is disliked by Allah or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. And this is the reason that the Sahaba and even the Prophet sallam, even the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, recommend us to seek Allah's forgiveness even after having salah. You know, when we have salah, the first thing that we do after making taslim is saying, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Why? Why a few people do this? The reason is because they actually feel shortcomings. How such a type of uh, salah uh, be yani, uh, presented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, how it was presented uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is uh, uh, this is a case of uh, the uh, this is a, a case of uh, the Sahaba and even the Prophet وسلم, to seek Allah's forgiveness of things that they think they may think that may please Allah. Okay, this is uh, briefly the Hadith of Allah. We are ready. Uh, Sheikh, so some of the scholars they mentioned that. It's also at least disliked to, to face faces for yes from the Qibla to the other aspects, such as the sun and the moon. Uh, no, because in most of those cases, it is uh, these are acts of worship. These are acts of worship. Uh, there is a hadith about it or a report about it, but it's weak. Uh, and it is, uh, it is not uh, uh, this rule. So the massive majority of the Muslim scholars did not accept this. It is a, 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 it is a shaz view, uh, shaz, an odd view of some scholars who said that, basing themselves on a weak report. It is even not permit. It is not haram even to turn one's face to uh, the uh, Prophet's Masjid or to Jerusalem because it hasn't been included in the Hadith of Abu Ayyub or even any other Hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And it is uh, there is uh, there is a few of some scholars who said that uh, it is not permissible for a person to have sexual intercourse facing the Qibla. Yani, out of this uh, yani, uh, exaggeration, but it is not, it is useless. It is not based on a dalil uh, to believe in it. Now. Any further questions? Uh, Sheikh Huna, um, the bathrooms yes. that are used nowadays do they have the same ruling as the bathrooms that were used um, from the time of the Salaf? Uh, yes, actually, it is. they are out indoor. That's why the uh, preferred view in this case is uh, to refer to the majority's view. As long as it is indoor, uh, even if it faces the Qibla, there is no problem because there is a wall. There is a wall. The case comes here if a person answers the call of nature outdoor. If it happens, I think it is difficult. But if a person goes outdoor and he would like so, he should care about facing the Qibla. But indoor, it has been reported from Ibn Umar and Jabir ibn Abdullah that the Prophet ﷺ did this. So the majority of scholars interpret it in this way. So our, our bathrooms here does not apply since there is an exception uh, in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if, if the person answered the call of Nietzsche and he has actually something in front of him. Sheikh, uh, can you see the other? Often, Sheikh. Uh, Sheikh. My question was more so about uh, uh, mentioning the name of Allah in the bathroom. That was, it will be haram because it's clean. But I think uh, that our bathrooms, the word al khala
is restricted to the place where the person uh, answers the call of nature. And it's not, in, it doesn't include, for example, a uh, place for taking a shower. It doesn't include the place where a person washes his face. So hence, he has a full sentence. So he, he can make wudu and he can mention the name of this case. No problem. Uh, hadith number 13 is very simple because it is actually the same ruling and the same discussion that we have with uh, the hadith of Abu Ibn Qudis, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar. And its title is The Propition of Facing Qibla When Defecating or Urinating, except when in a building. And Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab, radiyallahu anhu ma qal, raqiyutu yawman ala bayti hafsata, faraaytu nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallama, yaqdi hajatahu mustaqbil al-sham, mustadbir al-ka'ba, wa fi riwayatin mustaqbilan bayt al-maqdis. So the hadith reads as follows on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu said once I climbed onto turning the Kaaba another while facing, the, uh, facing Jerusalem. Uh, I think we discussed this hadith in the previous uh, hadith of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the pro I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam relieving himself. So Ibn Umar saw the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the roof by accident. And he only saw the upper parts of the Prophet's body. This meaning is supported by the Virgin of Bukhari in which he said, I went up onto the roof of Hafsa's house for a particular purpose, and so the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doing this. So this hadith is used as an evidence for the particular ruling of the permissibility of turning the face or back towards the direction of the Qibla indoors. This is proved by the narration found in Bukhari, in which Abdullah said, one day I went onto the roof of a house of our of ours and so the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, on two bricks to relieving himself while facing the direction of Jerusalem. So this hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar was the basis on which al-Imam al-Shafi, al-Imam Malik and Imam Ahmad according to two of his views, variant views, uh, relied actually to uh, believe that it is, it is an exception. So it is an exception indoor. So also while facing the Levant and turning his back to the Kaaba. So this segment of the Hadith apparently conflicts with the explicit meaning of our Yubal Ansari. And I want to report this issue. What I dedicated in this hadith, and I wanted you to know, is how to treat two apparently conflicting texts. Because we have an example of this, the three ahadiths, the hadith of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah, and the hadith of Ibn Umar. So what is the rule about uh, how to reconcile and how to deal with apparently conflicting texts? The first, if two texts of equal soundness apparently contradict uh, one another. So in this case, uh, we have to refer to one of those three or four steps. Number one, the first, according to this is a usuli perspective. Number one is to attempt to reconcile between those two ahadis or those three conflicting ahadis, or it's called jamma. Jam or reconciliation, if it is possible, so both texts are called reconcilable reports. So reconciling apparently conflicting reports is giving priority to acting upon one of them and neglecting the other. If reconciliation is not possible by all ways of reconciliation or interpretation, so we need to refer to 
abrogation. But reference to abrogation is conditional if we see that one of the two texts precede the other and we make sure about their chrono chronologically dated, that they, both of them, they have been chronologically dated, which means it gives us an indication that the Sahabi, for example, said that this happened immediately before the death of the Prophet or a few weeks before the death of the Prophet or the Sahabi, this was the last of the two conflicting commands that the Prophet first commanded and then he prohibited or he first prohibited and afterwards he commanded. If it is not possible to make any ways of preference, so the scholars in this case, uh, yes, in this case, we, we will treat one of the hadiths as abrogating and the other as abrogated, which means that has been canceled. And we have so many examples for this. Like, for example, the Prophet وسلم, prohibited them of writing down hadith, and later the Messenger وسلم, permitted them to do so. He forbade them of visiting graves, but afterwards the Prophet وسلم, allowed them to visit the graves, and he said that it admonishes and it reminds you of the hereafter. The Prophet وسلم, prohibited them of storing the meat of sacrificial animals beyond three days, Later, the Messenger وسلم, permitted that and he told them to store that. And he said the reason that he found some poor people visiting Medina, so he instructed them not to keep something in storage. If abrogation, if there is anything, yes, if there is anything that it is, this is in case of contradiction, if we, if we uh, believe that this is a contradiction and there is no room for reconciliation. Like for example, sometimes the Prophet issues two different issues in two different situations for two different rulings. So if there is a complete atta contradiction, so we refer to abrogation in this case, provided that we have knowledge about the chronology that one of them is abrogated and the other is abrogated. Number three, uh, was the ruling of, uh, ever applied to Al-Quds because it previously was the Qibla as well? If it is the case, was it abrogated? Yes, it was abrogated. Yes, it was abrogated. The reason for its abrogation that the Prophet Sallallahu restricted this only to the, uh, to, no, it is, it, this is not abrogated, but I'm sorry. The ruling here, it is, if there is, if there is a hadith, if we believe that there is a hadith that prohibits a person to turn his face to Jerusalem, so the hadith under discussion, the hadith of Ibn Umar, because according to the hadith of Ibn Umar, the Prophet وسلم, turned his face to his back to Jerusalem. He turned his back to Jerusalem. You see, my brothers and sisters, Jerusalem is north and the Kaaba is south to Medina, for the people of Medina. So once the Prophet ﷺ faced the Kaaba, according to the authentic hadith of Ibn Umar, he turned his back consequently, normally he, he turned his back to what? To Jerusalem, you understand what I'm saying? So here, um, if we fail to achieve this abrogation or to prove the uh, case of abrogation, we refer to preference, which means that if either of the above cannot be applied, then one, of them will be upheld and be given preference over the other, while the other would be put aside through the application of preference rules, which are kawa'ad uh, of Number four is suspension. If one of the two texts cannot be, cannot supersede the other by either of the rules of reconciliation, abrogation or preference, we have a tawaqqaf, the scholars stop on giving a ruling uh, unless they receive a conclusion or they have further proofs or to provide any other uh, ways of reconciliation. This is briefly what I wanted actually to share with you regarding the hadith of Ibn Umar. May Allah be pleased with him. Inshallah, <coughs> peace. Uh, Sheikh, so. Um, just a question regarding the definition of indoor versus outdoor. So in this hadith, he was able to see him from the roof. 
So was that, does that imply that the building can have just walls and that would be considered indoors because there's a barrier between you and the Qibla, or sorry, the Kaaba? Or is it that it has to have a roof as well? It doesn't necessarily see that, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that Ibn Umar uh, had the opportunity of seeing the body of the Prophet ﷺ, but it, at, at least there was a place and Ibn Umar uh, recognized that the Prophet ﷺ is inside this place. You understand? This is this is uh, basically the, mm. but the the Prophet ﷺ had been screened because it's not possible that the Prophet ﷺ is doing this in front of others. Right. So is it that the provided there's walls, even if there's no roof, that means that you're indoors? Yes, it was. It, this is uh, this is the explanation of Ibn Umar anhu, and even the scholars after him that they they confirmed that. This incident happened and the Prophet ﷺ was indoor, which means that he was in a place. Right. Well, yeah. Uh, another question is, uh, can a dense area of trees act as a cover when uh, in the open? The scholars explain this, that it is at least it doesn't have a distance of uh, one meter, one or two meters at least. So if it is, if it, if it is a bunch of trees and a person is screened, yes, there is no problem as long as he is, is close to it. There is no problem about it. No. He used to have a spearheaded uh, and he used to put a piece of clothes in front of it. And he used to use it as to screen himself away when he is answering uh, the call of nature. Barakallah. Uh, another question is, uh, is the propition facing the Qibla exactly or even the direction? Oh, this is, this is uh, a good question because uh, here we are talking about, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, it is the direction because, you know, for example, the, the Qibla is in southeast or northeast. So this is uh, uh, because it is not possible to exactly know the, the place of the Qibla. It is not, but if, now, now this is, and this is the view of Imam Ahmad because we will come to this point when we discuss how do we turn our faces to Qibla. We have two different views. The view of Imam al-Shafi'i that we have to exactly turn our faces to the place, to the direction, to the Kaaba. But according to Imam Ahmad, it is in the direction of the Kaaba. So if you turn a little bit right or left, it, it doesn't affect. Okay. But the view of Imam Ahmad in this case is preferable. Uh, brother Muhammad uh, and all brothers and sisters, inshallah, uh, we will have a break for 10 minutes, inshallah, and return back to our session. Okay? Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Thank you.